Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Michigan Historic Preservation Network webinar series. My name is Xiaohan Bao Smith. I'm the Historic Properties Coordinator of MHPN. And we are very excited today to have Brian Yap, um, Director of Programs and Operations at Motor City's National Heritage Area, and Steve Shotwell, Chair, Board of Trustees at Ford Paquette Avenue Plant to talk about how the Motor City's Herit National Heritage Area Challenge Grant Program can work for you. Um, before we get started, um, I would like to go over some Zoom tips. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box as, as you think of them, and questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. You are, um, feel free to type your thoughts and share your resources in the chat box. And both Q&A and chat box are located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please participate in the survey after the webinar concludes. If this is your first time attending our webinar, we are the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. We advocate for Michigan's historic places to contribute to our economic vitality, sense of place, and connection to the past. We could not do the work we do without our members and volunteers. If you are not a member yet, please consider joining us at www.mhpn.org. This webinar series is sponsored in part by an award from the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. And with that, I will turn it over to Brian and Steve. Thank you, Shohan, and, and welcome everyone. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. Excited to be presenting uh, before you and, you know, it's an important anytime we get together to uh, educate uh, new friends about the Motor City's National Heritage Area and as you're going to hear more about the Fort Piquette Avenue plant. So hopefully uh, today's session will be informative, not only about our two organizations, but about an opportunity that we have uh, for grants. Uh, for, so whether you're joining us live and have questions to ask, or uh, if you're viewing this after the fact, you've got plenty of contact information that's going to come up as we go along. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and get started with a little background information about the Motor City's National Heritage Area. And then very soon, uh, stay tuned, you will be uh, seeing Mr. Steve Shotwell. So first of all, the Heritage Area is uh, designated as a place of historic significance. It is part of the U.S. National Park Service. So you, as we uh, view this and as we sit in uh, Southeast Michigan are a part of what is considered a unit of the National Park Service. So we are one of 55 heritage areas around the country that tell the story of uh, America's history. Ours is automotive and labor history in Southeast Michigan but there's a heritage area in Pittsburgh that talks about the steel industry or one in uh, Dayton, Ohio that talks about the aviation uh, industry. So you get the idea that the heritage areas are meant to tell stories about a region, uh, whether it's cultural uh, or natural resources that affected that region and changed the country. Again, ours is, uh, is related to the automotive and labor history. We are really an affiliate of collaborative organizations and citizens and individuals uh, like yourselves. Uh, our mission is that we are dedicated to preserving, interpreting, and promoting uh, the region's rich automotive and labor heritage uh, and related economic development related to that heritage, which a lot of times preservation ties directly into uh, and while enabling, supporting, and respecting uh, the region's diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you can see on this slide our founding partners, Ford, at that time, would have been Daimler Chrysler, uh, General Motors, uh, UAW, and the National Park Service. But we really are our partners across the region. You are looking at one fourth of the staff of the Motor Cities National Heritage Area. And we accomplish a lot with a little, but it really is because we have such great people around the region, around Southeast Michigan, who help to tell these stories. And we're just here to sort of be the uh, collaborative force around that. We are the stewards uh, of amplifying that history. We are the voices uh, that need to be heard around the region. We really are our community and our projects. So a few of those uh, projects I'll talk about here um, as I show you the map of the heritage area. This is the 10,000 square miles of Southeast Michigan that we primarily cover. This is what a U.S. Congress designated as the places of concentration of automotive history. We often get the question, 
but can you go beyond that? Could you go north to X museum? Could you go down into Ohio and work with this museum? We certainly can, we're only bound by our story. However, this is our concentration officially in the footprint that's been drawn out. And this is officially the space where we can award grants, which we're gonna talk about today. So keep that in mind. Uh, and it's it's quite a bit in of itself. Uh, so we got a lot to take on just within this area, uh, even, even before we go outside of this area. Some examples of programming that you may have a scene, and if not, we want to get you connected with. One is our story of the week. Every Wednesday, we post a historic story as part of our You Ought to Know newsletter, which the newsletter itself is chock full of information about uh, other activities, our partners, upcoming events and programs. And then again, this historic story is there as the anchor to that newsletter. So it's a great way to keep in touch and learn something new about the automotive and labor history of our region. Uh, we are our events. There are, there are huge events around the region that bring a concentration. We've estimated around 6 million visitors come to the Motor Cities region just to attend these, these special auto events, the Wilbur Dream Cruise, the Back to the Bricks and Flint, which is pictured here, uh, the Concord d'Elegance, uh, you know, car show, and all those major events bringing all these visitors uh, every year, and of course, huge economic uh, impact. We are a National Passport Stamp Program. So I mentioned again that we are part of the National uh, Park Service, which means we are, just as any other national park around the country, eligible to have our national park stamp. So many of our uh, facilities around the region that partner with us have a stamp the same that you would get if you went to the Grand Canyon or Yellowstone Park or the Washington Monument, but you get it when you go to the Detroit Historical Museum, the Fort Piquette Avenue plant, the Michigan History Center, it documents the fact that you have been there to visit. So that's a real popular program and one that brings people to our region and gets eyes on the, um, the assets here. We are our wayside exhibit program. So these little interpretive signs uh, have been installed all over our region, about 300 of them in the ground. And they endeavor to tell the story of the people and the places and the ideas that made our region great. Uh, and so you see one here just right across the street from Fort uh, World Headquarters in Dearborn. But they're all over and they're, they're designed to be in places where people will encounter them. So they may you may find one at a library or at a community center, at the city hall, or along a biking or hiking uh, trail so as people come upon them, they're learning about the, the area that they're in, whether they're a visitor or a resident. We take projects from concept to reality, and one of which was the Fort Tree Bridge Park and uh, nestled in the connector and space between Detroit and Dearborn. Uh, this park was dedicated to the 1932 Fort Hunger March. I'll talk about that labor history. This was one of those seminal moments in uh, the relationship between uh, organized labor and uh, community and industry. Uh, and five people died in March that day, and we commemorate them at this park site that went from a concept to a reality. And so now this park is there for the community to enjoy. Uh, and the statue in the middle of it, again, represents, it's called March On. It represents the spirit of those who were lost that day and the energy around being able to move forward and learn lessons from our, our shared past. That's the ribbon cutting of, of that major event. There, we are a highway signs. Again, from concept to reality, the idea that you're in this large footprint, you're in the 10,000 square miles of the Motor City's National Heritage Area, but as you drive through it, you don't realize that. So we work with the Michigan Department of Transportation to install signs that bear the National Park Service's well-known arrowhead and sort of branded uh, us that as people drive through the region, they know they're in a very special place. So we were able to realize that vision after 20 years of hard work, realize that vision that now you see uh, these signs uh, positioned around the region uh, letting people know that they're entering uh, the heritage area and what they can expect as they get there. For today, we're, we're certainly here to talk about preservation and, and we will use the term revitalization a lot of times because we're revitalizing uh, many of the, uh, the historic buildings and uh, artifacts and assets that we know exist in the heritage area. When it started 22 uh, years ago, 23 years ago, it was based around uh, lost history. We wanted to make sure that we were not losing the heritage and the history of our uh, automotive founding. And so it was literal dumpster diving that was going on to make sure archives were preserved. It was literal brick by brick restoration, like the, the uh, visual you see here, where the Durant Dort office building in Flint went from the photo on the top left to where it is on the bottom right as a National Historic Landmark and an attraction uh, and the homestead of the uh, Genesee Historical Society. Right across the street from that is GM Factory One. And I will honestly say if the building across the street, the Durant Dort office building didn't exist, and if a high level General Motors executive was not happy to be taking a tour through there and peeked out of the window and saw this factory across the street and said, what about this building? Then he would have never learned the story of this being the original factory that the, um, that the Durant Door Carriage Company operated out of. So they call it Factory One because it was Billy Durant's founding of General Motors 
uh, that obviously led to the giant that we know today. But this is the space where it started. That building has been reclaimed by General Motors and now is a you know, training center and office space uh, in Flint. We are the Ford Village Industry Plants. I talk about how the Heritage Area was founded on the idea of revitalizing our, our existing resources. Well, the village industries were absolutely that. This really was part of the, the, the uh, genesis of it. In fact, we were going to be founded and be the Ford Heritage Trail. So the idea was that we were going to focus strictly on Ford, but we know we have more history than that. So it expanded to um, you know, include all of our auto manufacturers, both current and um, orphaned. But the village industries were forefront there. There were uh, many of these industries around, uh, up and down the waterways of the Lower Rouge, Rouge River and other rivers in Southeast Michigan uh, that were you know, left abandoned, were gonna be torn down in some cases. And all I believe with three had been adaptively reused now into some other use, whether they're a storage facility, um, a meeting place, um, a dining hall. Uh, this is the Nankin Mills, which is the seat of Wayne County Parks um, offices there. So we're so proud to have been involved with many of these projects, but that is literal definition of sort of preserving this space and revitalizing it uh, with some you know, great partners. And we are the Fort Paquette Avenue plan. I think, I think there's a project that exemplifies uh, the heritage area and its work more than uh, the Fort Paquette Avenue plant uh, there at Milwaukee Junction, uh, Midtown Detroit. It is what it was there on the bottom left-hand corner uh, when the group of volunteers walked in there. It is what it is now in the top right hand as a, a proud National Historic Landmark and Museum that you're going to hear about here. And with that being said, I'm going to stop my sharing and turn the, the mic over to my good friend, Steve Shotwell. So Steve is um, the most recent past president of Fort Paquette Avenue. And he'll talk about that because they're in an exciting transition period uh, for what's going to happen for the future. But we've worked together on quite a few projects over the years. And we thought it makes sense for Steve to come on and, and talk about uh, the way these sort of collaborations work and, and some of the, the projects that can come out of them, both physical restoration projects and some programmatic things. So, Steve, how's it going? Hey, thank you, Brian. Uh, appreciate the, uh, the great introduction there. And uh, we at Paquette are, <laughs> actually, we're about the same age in terms of our, both of our organizations. You know, we heard right about the turn of the century, uh, 2000 for us and a little bit earlier for, the, for you. So really, in many ways, we're the, the rookies around here. But uh, both of us have achieved so much. And uh, one of my goals today is to share with you a lot of those achievements and ways that Motor Cities uh, has been able to help us uh, directly with that. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, successes that we've recently had are, are, are directly a byproduct of, of things that Brian and the staff there at Motor Cities have been able to do, encouragement, support, you know, et cetera. So basically, I want to talk about the collaborative projects, and it's all about preserving history. Um, when you're in the museum business, you know, it's, uh, it's really kind of interesting. And the cat is very unique. Uh, how many times we go to museums, and it's a really nice building with a lot of neat artifacts in it. And our number one artifact is actually uh, the building. Uh, thinking. So I'd like to share some things with you. So really uh, this here, a uh, little bit of reading, you don't have to read all the words here, but basically uh, we were the home for Ford Motor Company between 1904 and 1910. Ford started in 1903 in a rental facility and was blew the walls out of the place in terms of making cars, not the Model T. Well, this is well before Model T's, uh, a lot of letter cars, et cetera. But we were the place where the, the Model T was uh, conceived and born and made the first 12,000 of them there before they moved to the gigantic uh, Highland Park. Um, proudly, the, we have a number of the things that uh, are significant to our growth. And one of those is the fact that uh, we initially were a dedicated Motor Cities National Heritage Area site. And that led to a lot of these others that you'll see here and all those kind of cascade up to being really a United States National Historic Landmark. And that um, puts us in a, in a great situation where certain kinds of grants, et cetera, and support are available. Uh, we're not affiliated with Ford and uh, we've had some really good history though, but I thought we'd have a little bit of fun first and uh, we're gonna take a look. And during that same time period on the other side of the screen here, I'm gonna show you a little bit about uh, what we look like. And Brian was showing you a picture. This is actually one that precedes the one that Brian was just showing you. Uh, this is actually what it looked like in the year 2000. And the bulldozers were, were warming up and ready to take this building out. It's only 56 feet wide, 402 feet long, three stories. It's, it's 68,000 square feet if you do all the math inside of there. So it's pretty good size, but it's very, it's a classic mill style of building. And this is what it looked like in early 1908. So it took us several years um, getting some grants, 
uh, getting uh, gaining membership, um, uh, a lot of donations, etc. And uh, it's actually the front facade brick restoration. And I put the Motor City symbol here because I'm gonna show you a number of product uh, projects at Paquette. And every time that Motor Cities has a direct invested, you know, grant to opportunities, et cetera, I'm gonna be throwing this uh, on the screen. And this right here was, was definitely it in early 2008. Uh, you see it's um, literally taking all the rotted bricks out, et cetera. This led to a wonderful ceremony uh, near the end of, um, or later in the fall, I should say, of uh, 2008. And uh, this is where we had this wonderful banner up here. And uh, Brian, I think you were actually one of the guys that was pulling on one of these ropes here that was helping us out to, uh, in terms of that. You see a lot of smiles on people's faces. And this was really our dedication of, of making this building come alive in terms of the front. And indeed now this is uh, pretty much what it looks like. Um, we're, we're very viable, um, and you're going to discover that um, with, with these, uh, all this support we've had and, and by making a better place, we've had some incredible growth. If you take a look here, you'll see, I've only uh, been tracking it for about 11, 12 years right here, but you can see uh, kind of what our, our membership, or not our membership, but our attendance was, and uh, I'd love to take my little Model T friend here and just uh, take him up the, the, the route with you because you're going to see that um, we're, we've been getting uh, 31,000 visitors. Now, these are pre-COVID numbers that you'll see right here, right now. This is only up to 2019. If you look at our 2020 numbers, um, about 7,900 and 2021, uh, we just posted these numbers. Uh, we're back now almost to where 2017 is. And a big part of this is that we do weddings. Uh, we're listed as being the number one place in the city of Detroit proper to have your wedding. And uh, we usually book them solid. And uh, it's a wonderful place to have a wedding or, or a meeting or event and amongst all these wonderful cars. We've got about 62 of the oldest cars in the world. And um, it really, really is kind of neat. So we think things are going well. We feel good about uh, hitting the 21,000 this last year. Our weddings now are coming back and uh, the business meetings are starting to come back too. Um, what we've been able to do with, with Motor Cities, uh, first of all, it's extensive. Um, it's a very, very uh, collaborative um, uh, a scenario with them, uh, giving us advice, but mostly giving support, you know, towards us. And here's an example of some challenge grants. Um, and we've had many of them at Paquette. Uh, the challenge grants quite often are contributing towards much larger projects. Uh, we did a, a huge brick stabilization project uh, back in 2016. And it looks like the building was actually falling apart. All this is after the brick restoration guys were kind of chiseling out the bad bricks. And uh, you can see them laying around the ground right here, even some of the uh, limestone um, uh, sills that are inside of here, all that, a lot of those got replaced. $178,000 is a lot of money. And uh, we did get some federal money that then we isolate our money from uh, Motor City's money. Uh, those two monies don't touch each other, but we have separate phases of the project and we strategically use um, our funding sources. And the $25,000 um, matching uh, grant that we got from Motor Cities really helped us tremendously. You can see, we still had to come up with about $97,000 of internal money. These are donations uh, that we've received uh, to be able to pull it off. Over here on the other side of the screen, um, an another project that I was extremely involved with. It was, these guys are up on the roof. These are major um, uh, timbers that are holding the roof up. You can actually see these old ones here, the, the roof leaked and all that's been fixed now with a, um, a new modern roof that's up there. But you can see that uh, we sistered up, that means threw on some wood to support it, et cetera. 362,000, took us a long time to raise that money. And again, that's where the, the challenge grants really, really helped us out uh, tremendously. The good news about this, and you're going to see other projects, is that um, we both these projects were finished on time and on budget, and that's not an easy task <laughs> at all. We've been very, very appreciative for a series of mini grants um, that uh, we've received uh, from Motor Cities. Uh, these are all competitive grants, uh, just like the challenge grants were. So we submit them to Motor Cities, they evaluate it. And I think uh, those are actually coming up here in the next week or two uh, in terms of they have a cycle of those that are coming. And what I'd like to do is bring your attention uh, down over here in the corner. And you can see this is the original map. And anybody that comes to Paquette, um, 
the guest experience is, is extremely important to any business, you know, uh, predominantly uh, museums here. So um, what we did is we've had this map and it measures, you know, about two foot by three foot hanging on the wall. And you can't see it very well, but there's push pins. And we would invite our guests when they come to Paquette to put these push pins inside of there. Well, the push pins actually filled all of the United States. You can't see it, but there's no room to put a push pin over here. <laughs> and throughout Europe, you're gonna see that it's pretty generous uh, too. So uh, basically what we did is we went to Motor Cities and submitted a mini grant for $750 to replace this um, map and put up new maps that are much larger using better pins, a better kind of a system. So these are the, the new maps that we installed. This was all done during COVID. Um, and I'm pleased to say that uh, you'll see some pictures of that process here. It really is kind of interesting. But what I thought I'd do is give you up close. This is actually a picture right here of where France is located. I'm circling with this. And these are the new uh, little pins that we use. And anytime a visitor comes in, we give them a pin and say, would you like to show us where you, know, you came from? So you can see, and, and these, by the way, were not done all done since COVID. I transferred the pins from here into the... In, in, uh, into the France, you know, picture that you see here. A lot of questions would come up naturally. Why is there a red pin? All these here, was that somebody that was really important guest or whatever? No, we're using this as another opportunity to really enhance the guest experience. A lot of people don't know it, um, but um, Ford Motor Company produced 15 million Model Ts uh, that held the record in the world until the Volkswagen Beetle beat it out uh, many, many years later. And uh, basically, there were 20 different assembly locations throughout the United States, and there were 21 around the world. So what I did in the map is I put a red pin in wherever there was another Model T assembly uh, location. A lot of these occurred in the 20s when production for Model Ts was going really, really strong. And um, so a lot of interesting things happen because now you hear a lot of oohs and ahs because these people didn't even know that in Bordeaux, uh, France, there was a Model T assembly location. And now there's a new sign on the wall that'll show you how much production they actually did out of that uh, facility. Makes it, uh, I, th I think, a lot of fun, uh, a lot of fun for people. As I was doing this, uh, I told you it was during COVID and uh, actually we were closed. We were able to, uh, this is a, during the dark hours of COVID early on, uh, we'd already received the grant and uh, I'm not one to ask for an extension on grants. I like to get things done because I made a promise. So we went ahead and followed through and did it. And here I was uh, putting these up here and there was a knock on our door. Uh, if you've ever been to Paquette, it's up on the second floor and the doors are locked because I'm in there working by myself. And there's this mammoth knock on the door and I would always go to the door. It's not unusual for us to get a lot of visitors on days that were closed. And uh, I would go there and there was this man that was standing there. And the first thing I usually ask is, well, where are you from? Because if we have any visitors coming from foreign lands or from, let's say, more than 150 miles you know, from Detroit, it's hard for them to come back. So the guy says, well, I'm from Kentucky. And I said, well, come on in. And they can conduct a, a self tour at that point in time. Well, this man was so impressed with this. And he, he says, can I be the first one to put a pin in there? I was explaining what it was. So here I, I captured a picture. And this is actually the first guy to use it. And he's wearing his T-shirt here that says Made in Detroit. So you could tell that this guy, he didn't buy it from us. So he bought that elsewhere. So I, I was really pretty impressed, you know, that the, the enthusiasm, et cetera, that was going on. And both of these signs include the Motor Cities logo at the bottom so that when visitors come, they'll know exactly where um, we were able to get the support to be able to do this. That was one project that well, we did. By the way, this was finished on time and on budget, proud of that. And the next one was we did a video kiosk. I'm gonna give you a little uh, window here so you can actually watch a little bit. This uh, video kiosk um, is something, it's all silent movies. Uh, the trick of it was picking movies that were all made before 1925. A lot of people don't know it, but in the United States, we have a 95 year copyright law that covers movies. And so if I were to buy, uh, take a piece of a movie that's before 1925, I was, I was safe on the copyright side. And what you'll see here is a whole series of um, videos that I was able to collect of Henry Ford. Uh, during a, a broad number of years, and many of them are after Paquette. Uh, there he's driving his quadricycle. That's his 1896, his first vehicle that ever made. He's actually driving it at Fairlane Estate. 
And it really is pretty exciting. And it's a silent movie because it's directly next to our registration desk where our greeting desk where uh, guests come in. Uh, the, the silent movies, by the way, also include some clips of Laurel and Hardy uh, when they, they use Model Ts extensively in a lot of their routines. And it makes it really kind of fun. Our guests stand there and their jaws are just hanging open. It's so much fun. And uh, the whole thing takes about uh, 15, 20 minutes almost uh, to go through. And then a lot of people will watch it multiple times. And uh, what I thought I'd do is give you a little picture here. So now I, I've talked about two projects, uh, both the, uh, the new signs as well as the new video kiosk. And this gives you an idea with altogether $1,500 minigram paid for the, us to build a wall. This was a storage area that wasn't very well used. And uh, we've got the videos uh, going on here and over here is this experience here with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the maps. So uh, it really dressed things out a lot better. Um, I put in, uh, in my budget, I really had about $1,600. So we had about $100 altogether that kept money. And that's because I wanted to have a little bit nicer video screen than what we originally looked at. Great, successful uh, project. And uh, when people come to Paquette now, we love it when they find new things. Altogether, we built four new exhibits uh, during the COVID time. And these ones with the support from uh, Motor Cities were uh, two of those. Next, I want to talk about wayside signs. Uh, I think Brian did a great job of talking about wayside signs. And, and the, there's literally hundreds of them uh, throughout Southeast Michigan. <clears throat> these signs, we're very fortunate to have six of these signs. There was so much going on on Paquette Street. Um, and the first of these uh, uh, signs over here uh, really represent some of the activities that were going on, not just at the plant, but also the culture of that day that's going on there. This sign here actually says Studebaker on it, if you look. And the reason for it is that um, uh, Ford moved out of the Paquette Avenue plant in 1910, and uh, Studebaker bought it in 1911. And uh, it was uh, renamed Studebaker. They also built two other mammoth buildings uh, next to Paquette. And so this um, wayside sign is uh, designed really to help educate uh, the people on the street relative to um, uh, what went on at Studebaker. Now, this exhibit was a catalyst really for something else really neat that happened. And basically what you're gonna see over here on the left side of the screen is that I have some volunteers. It's actually, um, the, our, our treasurer and his wife um, built all around inside of this area a butterfly garden. And they said, yeah, is it okay if we do that? I, I said, yeah, sure, I love it. So you'll see some of the classic sunflower, sunflowers and milkweeds and other kinds of things. And I, I underneath my own breath, I, I, I like to be a positive guy, but I, I, mean, I think, I don't know if there's any butterflies that live any place close to Paquette. You know, this is a, an interesting area of the city. And uh, I just don't know if that really exists. Well, reality is that the first day that these plantings went in, there was a butterfly. And yet it's hard to see, but I'm going to circle it right. There's a butterfly right there that was flying around with it, and within hours of when this was there. And uh, all these things are now just uh, phenomenal. These signs you'd think would be sitting out in the street and you wonder who's really going to look at them. And um, over here, this is where the museum is at. And we're kind of looking across the street at this. Constantly, there's cars that pull up here. They pull up and they start looking at the signs. Uh, right now, it's easy to tell because the snow is all around and you see the footprints are out there. Even though the times when we're closed, people are coming there because they want to learn. They see this and it's a natural attraction. The big hit for us this year is that uh, we submitted um, this, uh, this whole thing, the, uh, the wayside signs along with the... Uh, the Butterfly Garden, and indeed in 2021, we were awarded the uh, Keep Michigan Beautiful Award. So uh, this is a, a really, it's a tribute to um, really the, the Butterfly Garden, but it wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for Motor Cities coming up with these wayside signs and really making <clears throat> a wonderful learning experience for people that are coming up and, up and down the street. We appreciate it immensely. So with that, I want to say thank you very much, you know, for listening all about Paquette. Um, I think we're going to be taking some questions next and uh, be more than happy to entertain anything you might have. So, uh, so Steve, I, what we're going to do is um, based on a few of the questions, but I do want to get into the grant portion of it. So what I'm going to do is hold some of the questions that are already been posed for you. 
Excellent. Uh, we'll come back to them, okay? Because okay, I want to I want to cover just the grant basics and then we'll get the questions at the end. Hopefully, okay. there'll be a few more related to that. I, I'm glad Steve stepped through all of that because what it does is, is show you the power of uh, and the impact of even our relatively small grants. We are an entity of the National Park Service. We receive a certain amount of funding that has to run our operation that we have to match with other activities and then we grant out. And so we are able to, to uh, launch our challenge grant program based on a 20% match. But that amount of money, as seed money, as support money for projects has really been effective over the years uh, to the end that we started granting soon after we launched, we started in 98, where we finished our management plan and really got going in 2002. And every year since then, we've had our grant program. So for 20 plus years, Motor City has awarded uh, grants to over 300 projects. We've leveraged you know, $5 million in additional support. And that is, you know, no small thanks to you, you know, people like Steve and, and those who carry out these sorts of projects. You know, it shows you the power of the grants and how far they can go. And that's what we're trying to impart on the, uh, the audience here today. Because uh, we are absolutely accountable. That means for every $1 of tax uh, payers investment, we've leveraged $8 in our community because that's just what you've leveraged in the grant dollars. Then we take that and talk about some of our other uh, internal programming. It really is quite impressive as an investment. Uh, if you ever had a question about what the heritage area does for you, uh, it's, it's leveraged these dollars with a tremendous impact in and around our community. So let's talk about our grant program. Uh, this year, 2022, our grant focus areas remain education, um, though we also fund in other uh, subject matters and our, our, our mission, mission stated tourism and um, revitalization preservation are two of our other areas that we focus on. But this year in 2022, we're focused on education just as a, as a um, heads up. So those who are applying an education uh, related programming would receive additional points towards their uh, grant. Projects would exemplify diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that is uh, you know, one of our focuses that continues to be a value of the organization. And projects which allow virtual presentation, which may or may not be applicable to uh, you know, the MHPN audience, but the idea is that uh, we, we want to, as best we can, allow organizations to continue to pivot in a post-COVID world. So we asked the question just to make sure of those who are listening, uh, are you eligible for Motor City's National Heritage Area Grant? So the first question is, are you a recognized nonprofit organization, government entity, or educational institution in the National Heritage Area? I showed you the map earlier, you know, so we can only sort of grant to organizations that are operating on projects that are inside that footprint. Uh, so if so, then we are one check in. Do you have a project which is designed to highlight the rich automotive and labor heritage of our region? So a lot of times, our, uh, especially our historic buildings, uh, you know, are tied to it in some way. It's a home, it's a factory, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a UAW hall, it's a place where something significant happened, but the preservation could also be based around an artifact, a collection. So keep in mind that it could be broader than just a physical place. Uh, but do you have a project designed to highlight that rich automotive and, and labor heritage? I say highlight, it doesn't have to be exclusive, but if so, then that is also a check mark. A lot of times our, our local municipalities, our, our, our city history groups, you know, they're talking about the history of their city, which absolutely would include automotive, but it doesn't have to be a tribute to automotive. It just has to be included. You have a timeline that fits into completion by the end of 2022. We are a federal entity and our, our timeline works where our fiscal year starts October 1st and ends September 30th. So grants we're awarding now uh, and during our open grant cycle would have to be completed by uh, September 30th of 2022. We have a new grant cycle opening in the summer for 2023. So, uh, but if you do, then that's a check mark. And the last is, are you a member of the Motor Cities National Heritage Area? We say member as, because that shows that you're vested in uh, the heritage area and its work, and uh, we want to be partners with you. So being a member of the heritage area is part of being eligible for our grant cycle. So if all of these elements are uh, indeed correct, if all these elements are checked off, then you are eligible. You are ready to apply for Motor Cities uh, grant. And we can talk a little bit further in the next few minutes um, as I present the actual grant application process. So you'll, you'll listen up and I'll tell you a tale of how you go from um, interested to um, connected to our grant program. Again, the online application and it's only online at motorcities.org slash grants. So we don't receive any paper applications. The entire process is encompassed on our website and you would find it there. And our current grant cycle that we're in opened January 1st and ends February 28th. So we still got a couple more weeks for those who are thinking of projects and hearing this presentation. So we'd love to have you uh, consider uh, applying for a grant. But now the moment you've been waiting for as all of this talk and build up uh, leads you to the form. So we have to talk about the forms that you would be seeing as you go to our website and I'm going to uh, step you through uh, quite a bit of it. Uh, but I encourage you 
as my information has been posted as a contact, uh, that you would reach out to me with the specifics of your project and let's talk about what you might be thinking about doing. Sometimes I can speak in generalities, but I can also speak very specifically about uh, what you're considering. So the very first thing you'll see is the, the basic information about your organization, your project's name, uh, your project start date and end date. So you can start it whenever you like, as long as it's after the date that you apply for the grant. So for instance, we're taking applications as of uh, February 28th. So that means your project has to start on or after February 28th. Uh, your end date, though, obviously has to be, as I mentioned before, by September 30th of this year. So if you got a, a nice summertime project that you're thinking about, that's the time frame that you will be working in. We do want you to indicate whether you are uh, part of a National Historic Landmark. For instance, as Steve has mentioned, the Fort Piquette Avenue plan is a National Historic Landmark. Because we're part of National Park Service, who also oversees that program, it's important for us to report up to them when, when anytime we're doing work associated with a National Historic Landmark so that they're aware Sometimes it leads to modifications and major, you know, major uh, things that are going on. Sometimes it's just to be aligned and aware, but we do want you to indicate that. Park organization's name, that's you. That's your organization's name. So Fort Pitt Avenue plan, for instance, we'll go here. Uh, we need to identify your federal tax ID. We use that to obviously verify that you are a nonprofit organization based on uh, what you described. Are you a member of Motor Cities? And as I explained, you would have to be answering yes there, and you want to make sure you are a member uh, to maintain um, the grant application and, and the award. Uh, and then you would select which mission area. We have three areas, education, interpretation, and revitalization uh, through preservation. So you would choose one of those three as your main area that you're addressing here. Um, we go to that next section of the application, name and title of the authorized partner official. So this is the person who would be responsible for acting on behalf of the organization, signing an agreement. So if you were awarded a grant, who do you send the agreement to for signature? Sometimes that person is the same person as we'll talk about all throughout. Some organizations are small and streamlined enough where there's one person that handles all of this. But in some cases, we, we need to know who that main person is, and maybe the executive director, maybe the chair of the board, and maybe someone above that. Uh, but we need to find out who that person is. Then we want to know who the project contact is. This will be the person that will be primarily communicating with me in our office about what's going on with the project, how far things are along, what's going on with the budget or supplies. Uh, and sometimes, again, that is the same person. Sometimes the executive director is wearing all those hats, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes we have another person that we need to talk to about what's going on day to day with the project. Similar uh, uh, sort of mindset about the fiscal contact. Again, for some organizations, very vertically integrated. They're all the same person. Other organizations, you've got a president, you've got a director, you've got a CFO or accountant. But we need someone who we can be in contact with if we have questions about the financial information that you submit invoices or timesheets, et cetera, throughout the project. So we need to make sure we know who that person is. If they're the same person, we'll just repeat names, but that's okay. Uh, then we get into the actual, um, the details about the project. So the total project costs. So if we were uh, working, you know, I'll, I'll use Steve as an example. If we were gonna put a section of roof on the Fort Piquette Avenue plant, it costs $100,000, so nice round numbers, then that would be your total project cost. You would put $100,000 here. So then you might ask them, what is the total eligible project cost? Well, eligible costs are any costs that are not uh, ineligible based on the guidelines that I'm going to describe to you. Uh, and if they were ineligible, you would subtract them from here. So let's say that Steve's roof is $100,000, but $10,000 of those dollars are for uh, smoothing a big fundraiser, you know, smoothing a big donor. But we cannot use our federal funds to support uh, the entertainment uh, fundraising lobbying or food and entertainment costs. So we do have to remove those from the beginning. So if, if he estimates that it's going to cost him $100,000 to pull it off, but he's got to spend $10,000, you know, whining and dining the, the, the donor and another uh, or, or lobbying the city of Detroit for uh, clearances or things like that, we need to remove some of those things out of the uh, total project cost. So let's say, let's say we're $95,000 in. So then you would ask for your uh, requested share. So uh, you would decide, well, of that eligible amount, you need to request the 20% of it that Motor Cities is eligible to pay you. So if you are going for, for instance, 95,000, you know, you would go times 20% and you will put $19,000 there as your request to Motor Cities. So that means the remaining amount needs to go in applicant share. That way the math all adds up. So we have a completed project with all the elements accounted for. So let's talk about then uh, some common questions about the difference between total project costs and eligible costs, which I've just explained, is which ones are not eligible. So here are some eligible costs. 
your contractors, your consultants, your materials, the services rendered, staff, staff dedicated to a project. And this is within the reason that you can document it. It's always great to see that as an opportunity, but you have to be able to document that. Volunteer hours as well, usually sometimes a huge, huge element of this because we do take volunteer hours as in-kind value. Uh, and so if you can document your volunteer hours, they can sometimes be huge in making the match for our grant. So to think about that $100,000 goal, but a lot of that can be made up when you talk about uh, things like staff hours or volunteer hours, uh, volunteer mileage where appropriate. So if you if your volunteer has to travel from your site to go to Home Depot 150 times to pick up the pieces and the parts, you can, if you calculate it properly, you can include the mileage back and forth for the project there. Um, and the in-kind value, which again is sometimes a huge, oh, huge bonus. We've done projects with Paquette. Uh, your, your glass windows, for instance, are a great example of this where the windows, the glass itself, I think, was donated by uh, you know, a local company in some cases. So the value of the donated glass would be part of that. And then you have to do the labor to install them. That's an you know, example. And I think a lot of times our nonprofits and partners run into that where they're getting donation of, of goods uh, and they're able to classify those and get the value from those. Some ineligible costs are costs not directly associated with the project. Uh, so we cannot pay for all the incidental costs related to the organization if it's not related to the project that you're doing. So in our uh, placing our roof uh, example, if we're, we're talking about the roof. So if, if you've got costs associated with putting new lights in the gift store, we're not talking about the roof anymore. Funds for another federal funding source. So Steve pointed that out too, that sometimes we have our organizations that are receiving grant and, and funds from other sources. We are a federal entity and most guidelines say, all guidelines say that you cannot match federal money with other federal money and so you have to keep those two separate. You can you can receive it, but you just can't use it as match for the the um, grant that we are giving. And activities perceived as fundraising. So again, if you are whining and dying a potential uh, donor, if you are using the funds to create um, nice fancy glossy packages that you're going to send out to solicit donors or in a capital campaign, we cannot contribute uh, the federal dollars to that sort of work. Food and beverage costs there are sometimes within reason, but for the most part, we strike food and beverage from it because it's one of those things that's just so unwieldy and hard to pin down that uh, it'd be hard to justify uh, using those. In general promotion of events and conferences, a lot of times people wanna sort of sneak those in essentially as a sponsorship, uh, but we can't exchange our grant dollars for say, hey, we're gonna put your logo on this thing or we're gonna put your logo on a sign or, or preach you. We can be part of the activity of an event or a conference. We can be a sponsor of a speaker or support of a speaker. We can help you create a, a historical guide. Many times we've done that with the Michigan Historic Preservation Network's big conference, but we can't just be a general um, a general sponsor to a conference. Uh, utilities and maintenance costs, which cannot be easily identified. So this is where the entire light bill or entire gas bill for an organization can't be submitted as an eligible expense for a grant because we need to know how much of that was for the project you're working on and how much of it is just general maintenance. So it's important to you know, be clear about the eligible and ineligible costs. Uh, then we go on to the next section, which is your project summary. This is the part that is most uh, specific and unique to you. So this is where you get to tell your story about what's going on with your project and why you need the funds to support what you're gonna get done. Uh, so you would wanna sort of write, make sure you're writing to these goals, which is the relevance to the Motor City's mission, the capacity of, for your organization to pull it off. So this is where you would include things like your budget, um, you know, narrative, your letters of support, uh, background, the, the principles of the project, people who will be working with you to further uh, strengthen your stance as far as why you should receive the funds, your sustainability plan, so what's going to happen to your project uh, once we're done with it. So if, if you're going to put the first section of the roof on, what's your plan to do the second section and the third? You know, how are you going to support that as you move forward, you know, as an example of what you would include there? Some people's plans are very long and raw, uh, ranging. Some people's plans are very immediate. Uh, and some people will be applying to us to create the plan, which is okay too. So let's talk about that. So we can talk about that. Uh, and how is Motor City is recognized? Of course, we are uh, funding this with US Park Service dollars. So we wanna make sure there's an appropriate recognition, a logo, a nameplate. Some people have placards, a shout out in the newsletter, but something that says how you're gonna recognize Motor Cities and then how you're gonna measure the performance. So when you say you're gonna do a thing, how are you gonna tell us that you did that thing? A lot of times when it's brick and mortar, when it's you know nuts and bolts, uh, you can show us you know, pretty clearly, you know, other projects, as you would imagine, maybe a little more difficult when they say we're going to increase visitor awareness by 20 percent. Well, tell us how. Where if you say I'm going to restore the facade of this building, well, it'll be pretty clear day and night uh, that you need the project. 
Uh, so that's where you would put this information and you would go a little more verbose into the project description. A few more sections here where you would start to upload those relevant uh, uh, documents that I explained. So if you've got a business plan or master plan, an interpretive plan, something that details where you are in the process to where you're trying to go, you know, in the grant that you were asking us for. So it shows you that you didn't just pick up uh, your pen and paper today and decide that you wanted to apply for a grant, but you have a plan for what you're going to do with it. Uh, so you would explain that there and explain how Motor Cities will be recognized in that process as an announcement, as a media event, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and then you would go into your performance measures. You would talk about how you're going to measure whether you're preserving that artifact or site, or you're educating X number of children for, you know, via X number of school trips. So you're going to distribute X number of brochures at your major event or host a, a conference that, you know, invites this many participants. So some way that you're going to measure the outcome of your project. Uh, and you would have a space to put those uh, measurements there. They need to be tangible, measurable outputs uh, for the project. And if you got questions about that, we would certainly encourage you to give me a call. And you would explain the method in which you're going to measure. So if I said I increase visitors, it's because we have a person that each visitor purchases a ticket, or there's a person at the door with a clicker, or we did a, a, a sample survey of it. But some way that you're going to tell us how you collected the data that you uh, supplied here. And one example, you know, since we're talking about revitalization, one example here is that if you set your performance measures that the project will produce an operable architectural and engineering plan for this historic property, great. You know, that, that is exactly what we would love to see have happen. And your tool for measurement and your, and your output would be the plan. It would be very simple to say that the plan was produced and implemented by the date that you uh, listed there as an end date. So that's a pretty straightforward um, you know, strategy that for that as far as being able to report the outcome of this sort of goal is that you would like to create a plan, use our funds to hire a contractor and, and do the development work, or, or you know, and then you produce the plan and we would get a copy of that as the evidence that you produced it at the end of the grant. And then the uh, the final element would certainly be the, well, not the final element, but the next element would be uh, your budget. So you need to have an Excel spreadsheet or something that details your budget. Some people's budgets are you know, a single line. It might be one vendor that you need to work with. One person's going to put this roof on and that's the end of it. And other people's budgets might be include contractors and consultants and, you know, multiple trips to Home Depot and a few trips here and a, and a, a little work there and some duct tape and, and glue over here. And so you need to include all those details if best you can, you know, line out what you're going to include in your budget to pull off your project. So the budget would be uploaded uh, to the site in this section as well. So again, budget can include all of these folks. It can include contractors and consultants, materials and services, staff hours as best you can estimate, um, you know, with the proper documentation. I say that because some people are able to pull timesheets. Some people are able to pull pay stubs. Some people are able to give us a, you know, a letter or a statement from whomever oversees the pay uh, that says this person's time was dedicated to this project for this many hours at this rate. You know, we can do that. But some way that you back it up instead of just, you know, pulling it out of thin air. Um, volunteer is the same thing. You, you need to have a method, whether it's a sign-in sheet for your volunteer day. Maybe everybody comes on Mondays to work on this project, but they should sign in on that Monday that they came there and sign in, sign out, or everybody comes for two hours. So you have a listing of the 10 people who were there for two hours so that you have some evidence that you had those hours of volunteers that can be, um, you know, again, substantiated for in-kind value. Uh, and of course, in-kind with proper documentation. I think this is one of the, the biggest ones that I point to that may sometimes be overlooked in that you can get the in-kind value of that person that's gonna help you with, hey, we, we can donate a load of cement to help you with your you know, foundation work, or we, we can donate the bricks or, or the time to do this. Uh, the in-kind donation can't be though, that you've got a lawyer on your, on your board and that lawyer normally makes you know, $500 an hour. And so that lawyer decides to come and help you paint. Well, their painting is not worth $500 an hour. You have to use their, the volunteer rate for that. So. Uh, you, you're using the value based on what that person's professional service would be worth otherwise. And that's how you kind of want to look at it. Uh, so the last section, as I mentioned, is the supporting material. So this is what you would upload to our site as the additional support. So your IRS letter, again, as I mentioned, you would have to have identified your, um, your tax ID number. You want to list your current board of directors who's responsible for the organization and oversees it. Any letters of support that we advise that if you have five, six, 10 letters of support that you combine them into one single document. So the best you can, a single PDF of all of the letters, but it's, but it's necessary to see that others support your project and your vision and you wanna upload that there. And then any other materials which are optional. 
So if you have uh, files, documents, plans that you want to upload, then you would uh, supply them there. And so with that, we will have reached the uh, end of the application process. So you will have submitted your application to Motor Cities and you'll be well on your way uh, to being considered. So we would hope to have worked with you uh, with the application uh, being successful. And I think we're just at um, that time. So I'm gonna stop, stop my screen share because I've given you the basics of the Motor Cities grant process. Again, I would encourage that if you are uh, interested in it, that you would reach out and um, you know just have further conversation with me as a reminder that the grants are due on, well, let me put that right back up. I'm gonna share this one more time. The grants are due on February 28th and we will announce awards by March 18th, so about three-week turnaround there, so that you would be aware of the project that you need to kind of launch into. And then these projects that we're talking about now are to be completed by September 30th. If there's a project that goes you know, broader than that, um, then we might want to look at our 2023. So that is the information on the Motor Cities Grant uh, Program. And I'm going to now go back, Steve, to uh, some of the questions we had. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll try to uh, shoot the answers in here. So. Um, uh, sure. yes. Yeah, you got it here. So Janet wants to ask you uh, about visiting Phuket over the years that it's been open and she's noticed that the blocks around it have come back to life. So can you comment on sort of the development around yeah. that? I'll make that one quick and it's it's really positive. Uh, we're in what's called Milwaukee Junction. Uh, a lot of think of, people think of New Center. If you're not familiar, we're darn close to the Fisher Building uh, and the GM Building, you know, Woodward and uh, Grand Boulevard. And um, we, we witness all kinds of things. I'll, I'll give you a, a, one great example. There's a gentleman that just recently bought the Studebaker building and I invited him to come to Paquette because I wanted to meet him. He's our next door neighbor. He put down a map that he just bought 17 buildings all around us, including the Fisher building he bought and the Albert Kahn building. These are major facilities. And he put down $340 more million in terms of a plan to fix them all up. And uh, that, that is moving forward, uh, if it gives you the idea. A lot of changes. We have new street lights, you know, um, I'm not talking about traffic lights, but really safety street lights, et cetera, that have been installed around. There's all kinds of things that are going on. Uh, there's a reju rejuvenation effort right now uh, for all of Milwaukee Junction. And we have a nucleus of, uh, uh, of uh, people that get together and have meetings and we talk about how we can help each other. It's, uh, it's very positive, very, very, very forward moving. So things are looking up, are good. Yeah, well, always good to hear, for sure. But yeah, I guess you can take uh, the way the way they've come in, you can kind of take the uh, next few questions as well. So Because you, you can see these, right? The, uh, yes. Well, okay, th this, yeah, this, is, this is a good one in terms of characterize your membership and our visitors. You know, do you get older, younger people, men, women, you know, et cetera. Paquette, without a doubt, during our first five years, so this is up through even when the place was in shambles, you know, we're pulling it together, we would get what I would call car nuts, N-U-T-S, car nuts. These people, it doesn't matter what it is, and, and, and Brian's nodding his head because he knows who those people are too, you know. Anything that deals with automobiles, their, their uh, manufacturing, their development, any of that kind of stuff they want, and, and they, they will just absorb everything. Those are the kinds of people we got initially. I did a major survey about five years ago from a, a national organization, and we discovered that, yes, those car nuts are still coming, but they're now being outnumbered by families. And uh, we get so many families that are there. And what's interesting, our survey even pointed out that it's not the man in the family that's suggesting that. It's actually mom in the family who is looking for an activity that she thinks that dad will enjoy and the kids will enjoy. And as a, a family unit, they're gonna have a really good time. So our exhibits now are changing. Um, instead of addressing all the car nuts all the time, uh, we're starting to uh, em embed new exhibits that deal with the culture of the day because we want to appeal to there. We have kids activities. Uh, we have a scavenger hunt that goes on inside of the museum, uh, supported by iPads, things that the kids really enjoy. So this change, if you're doing your job right, you should know who's walking in your door and what are they looking for and also what did they find while they're there and what did, were they looking for that they didn't find so we can start addressing those things we're having a ball it's fun well you might and you can hit that next one uh, and i know this is sure. a complicated issue sometimes about the systems of the building fire suppression heating cooling yes. plumbing, electrical you got a, a jewel there but how do you keep up with all of that 
Yeah, I, I, I think this person may have a, a, a little bit of a clue in terms of, yeah. Paquette right now is facing a major renovation program. Above my head, uh, if you can see my picture, it says preserving the legend. And uh, we just announced a campaign. Uh, we're putting in a, an, a new elevator that's a passenger elevator, a legal elevator. Uh, we're doing heating and cooling. We're doing a major change to our electrical system. Um, Brian, you've been talking about that coming up, you know, this, this coming year. Uh, we're putting in uh, classrooms. Uh, we're doing a major renovation of the business office that used to be there at Paquette. Uh, right now, when you come to the front door of Paquette, it's locked because that used to be rented out to a tenant. When that tenant is now gone. And uh, we're, we're restoring that area to the way that it used to be in 1904. So um, basically, the, all of these things right now are, are being revised and improved. Uh, we have new bathrooms going in. Um, we do a major thing on, on weddings. So we're building a facility so those weddings can be in that same location. We can set their tables and chairs up and leave them. The caterers can come in. There's a warming kitchen. Uh, this is a $7.5 million uh, package. Uh, it hasn't been publicly announced yet. But I'm pleased to tell you, I just was working on donations uh, before this um, this uh, seminar came into place, and we're now up to about 1.3 million we've collected without announcing it. This is our, our own board members and uh, other key people uh, in our uh, membership that we know that want to help us, and uh, we'll be announcing uh, this whole campaign publicly in the near future. Okay. So uh, things not only are things improving around Detroit, things are improving inside of Paquette as well. Wow. You kind of already announced it there, just, uh, just uh, yeah. I kind of did announce it, didn't so I? If it, people it, have it. The people on this uh, on this call or watching this video, they're going to go deep in their pockets now. Yeah, there you go. Reality, so. We appreciate everything, every bit of help we can get. Sure, yep. sure, absolutely. Yep. No. and uh, somebody, uh, and I'll answer one of the uh, questions regarding the grant uh, here. It says during the term of the grant, is Motor City's monitoring expenditures on a regular basis so that if a cost is found ineligible, the grantee has time to make corrections. So honestly, we we would we would kind of discern that even from the grant application, realizing that the budget would be a big part of that. You would sort of detail out some of your costs. And as long as it doesn't fall into one of those, those sort of no-no cost centers that I described, we're usually okay. There's very rarely a situation where uh, a, an expense comes in that's already approved in your budget and then is deemed ineligible. The only other way that would happen would be if it happened outside of the grant period because we can't fund anything prior to you being awarded. And if it goes up to September 30th, we can't fund anything after September 30th. So we're talking about the date on the invoice or the or the the payment, however it's tr uh, transacted, you know, has to fit within the time frame. But other than that, if it's if it's approved in your budget, it's gonna, you know, be uh, just fine as far as an eligible expense. We would identify those right up front, and uh, you know that way we would track it. With that being said, yes, we would absolutely uh, track along the way. If if you are awarded our grant, you're able to submit for payment on a monthly basis. So if you got your hundred thousand, or if you got your um, you know, $20,000 grant from Motor Cities, for instance, for your $100,000 project, you can submit as quickly as you turn around with your work and activities and payments, you submit those payments and evidence of uh, the clear checks back to us and we start the reimbursement process. So we would catch any anomaly along the way, uh, though a lot of times people tend to wait till the end, we would catch it along the way. So the more frequently you are requesting reimbursement, we'll catch those. Uh, and la last question, uh, from Janet, and we, we love to hear from Janet. So Janet, in spite of the federal funding going through cycles of increase and decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease and de oh, sorry, uh, Motor Cities has survived. Um, this is how have you maintained your support and who are the federal and congressional champions? By the way, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, we, we've survived for 24 uh, years, actually. I misspoke. We'll be 25 years old next, next year um, for 24 years. We've survived with the support of partners like you, you know, those who have, have supported uh, with membership and sponsorship and outside funding because it is incumbent upon us to do that and match. But it's no, no doubt about it that primarily our federal funds support our work. And, um, you know, so we have had a great relationship with the National Park Service. We've had funding maintained through various acts of Congress. And if you can understand it, you get a job in DC, but it's a very complicated uh, group of machinations that leads us to a budget. But we've maintained through all of that and there's active work right now to ensure that the heritage area lives on another uh, several years, um, you know, beyond this. I actually got a few more, um, few more questions. Shohan, I don't know if we, do we have a hard stop or do we need to 
wrap it up or can we get a few more? No, I think um, those are great questions. If you have time to stay for a little bit longer and we would like to have those questions answered. If that's sure. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll stay, you know, we'll do some overtime here just real quick. Um, so what is the most common error applicants tend to make so we can avoid that when we apply? I think the, the common error is uh, oddly enough mathematical, you know, so sometimes they're submitting their budget and it doesn't add up, you know, they've left something out or they put too much in and they haven't tailored it in a way that is specific to our grant application. Some people, and, and we get it that you have grant writers and people who manage this process and sometimes, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of churning them out back to back to back and it's, it's you know, it's hard to customize it, but, you know, the questions we've asked are germane to the heritage area, to the National Park Service funding, and we'd like you to make sure those questions are answered appropriately. So uh, take the time to answer the questions and make sure it's tailored to other cities and be careful about making sure you, you know, your, your budgets and your numbers add up so that it all makes sense. I would say that's a common error that we get that you, you know, you don't want to have people um, miss those. Uh, you know, the question is, what is the review process of the application? So there, once the applications are submitted, uh, you're looking at the first line of review, which is that I will receive them and review them to try to make sure they're complete, to make sure they have all the elements that we've asked for, to make sure that the 501c3, um, you know, is, is there, make sure that it's valid, make sure that you've attached your board of directors and budget and all those things that are requested. So that's step one. And to make sure everything adds up and makes sense. So oftentimes you'll hear back from me before it gets forwarded on, because I don't want to, our goal is not to be punitive. We don't want to pass along a grant that's incomplete and have our grant committee review it. With that being said, once the grant is considered to complete to the best of their ability, we, um, you know, we make sure that we are, you know, passing it along to our grant review committee. Our grant review committee consists of uh, people who have a statewide perspective on the subject matter that I've described. So those who are able to discuss matters of tourism, matters of uh, education, interpretation, and matters of revitalization and preservation. So they are gathered and they review the applications, uh, independently score them and their scores are, are compiled in order to decide who's awarded. Uh, they, they recommend awards. Sometimes they'll recommend even feedback to the applicant. They'll say, well, hey, you know, let them know that we'd like to award them, but they need to clean up this part or tighten up this. Uh, and, you know, we, we go ahead and, and, you know, try to work with the applicant to do that. Again, it's not about being punitive. We want to be supportive as much as we can to get the federal funds from the uh, federal coffers through us uh, to you all to, to these great projects we described. So that is the review process for the applications. Okay, I think that was the last one. So Ryan, gonna... I've been throwing a few answers at people here just on the keyboard uh, as okay. well. Got it, got it. It's a good Batman and Robin here, it good, good works. <laughs> This is a really great um, webinar. I think potential applicants will really benefit from listening to the information that you shared. Um, this webinar is being recorded and um, you will get a link when the recording is available in the next few days. So please feel free to share um, with your friends and colleagues. Um, and um, so our next webinar is scheduled for March um, 20. Fourth, and the topic is restoring the tower at Michigan Central Station. And we will hope to see you all next time. And thank you again so much, um, Brian and Steve, for your time sharing your knowledge and all the information with us. And um, we hope to that um, see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening.